Hi everybody. Ooh. All right. Hi, I'm Chris. Hi, I'm Demi on the GitHub. I'm currently a senior engineer at Sixter. Um, today, this is a totally different topic. Like we're going to talk a lot about like we want no dependencies. <laughs> Unlike Tony's, which is all about dependencies. Um, there's also going to be no Rails in this. This is all just straight Ruby as what it was at its core, and that's a scripting language. Um, so we're going to talk about using it for that purpose instead of building web applications and all sorts of fun and fancy stuff. And we're going to be talking specifically about using it to script your Macintosh laptops for those of you who have them. So first we should probably talk about like what's already on your Mac for doing automation because part of how this works is that Ruby ties into a lot of these other technologies and adding an actual programming language to some of the stuff we're going to talk about makes a lot of these things way more powerful. So the first one, how many people here are already familiar with AppleScript? Of course you are. <laughs> so AppleScript is the scripting language that comes with every Mac. And you'll notice in little tiny letters underneath there it says, or JavaScript. For the past couple of versions, you can do the same things in a JavaScript base thing. They're both supported. Um, I actually kind of like AppleScript more, <laughs> which is going to be weird when you see this example. So this is an example of what AppleScript looks like. Um, essentially, AppleScript makes it so that everything on your computer is an object. It is an object-oriented language, after all. So your applications are objects. The things inside of them are objects. Everything else. And the thing is you can sort of do with this language is you can do things like drive Mac applications. You can tell an application to like send a canned message to somebody else or send an email or play the next iTunes track or do whatever. And we'll see some examples of things you can do with it here in a minute. You can also work directly with the finder. You can get user input, like pop up a little box and ask somebody to input some things. You can pop up dialog boxes. You can be real annoying if you want to. <laughs> One quick way to see this is through the app script editor. Um, you should already have it on your Mac, so I think it comes pre-installed. Seth, stop me at any moment if I say something that isn't true. All right? <laughs> and so this is a, a fairly lightweight text editor that's geared around writing specifically AppleScript or JavaScript. And you can write scripts in here and then run them and sort of test them out. It's a really great playground. The thing that's really handy with script editor, though, is every app has what's known as a dictionary. Um, wee, that's tiny. In fact, you can see this list here of all the apps on my particular laptop that have an AppleScript dictionary. And if we wanted to look at one of these, what's a good one? Uh, let's look at Byword. So every one of these apps has its own little definition of like what you can script with it. So in the case of Byword, which is a text editor, in case people aren't familiar, we'll see it here in a little bit when I demo some stuff. Um, so this is not a very good one. All it has is a document object. So just from this, I know that I can probably tell application Byword make new document with title something, probably something like that. Um, some of the ones that have a little bit more or when you get into like the Apple apps. So for instance, if we look at everyone's favorite app, iTunes, it will crash the script editor. <laughs> yeah, because it has so damn many. Yeah, thanks Apple. Um, <laughs> so, um, but that's example. Every, most, not every, most applications on your Mac come with these Apple script dictionaries that are sort of hidden. Like they don't like pop it up in your face like, woo, look at all this stuff you can do. Instead they come embedded with these dictionary files that walk through all the stuff you can do. Don't worry, we've got to get to Ruby. Just wait. All right? Another piece you might want to know about is LaunchD. Um, as it kind of says there, it's like Cron, except somebody said we really want this to be an XML. Um, <laughs> and specifically it is this funky type of XML that Apple uses all over the place. It's called a plist, which is short for property list as you can probably ascertain from that right there. This is an example of one taken off my actual machine. This is a plist that Spotify installs that essentially tells it to run at load if you're connected to the internet, I think is what that one means, this particular program. So through LaunchD, and this sort of format, and there's different formats for doing a lot of these things, um, they live in one of two locations. One is in tilde library launch agents, that's your user folder, there's one for every user on the system. 
and the one at the root level, so slash library slash launch agents. There is another one that I'm not mentioning here that's at slash system slash launch agents. Don't mess with that one. <laughs> that's how Apple itself sort of runs things on a schedule when you start out. Um, and you can have these run at load. You can have it run at load and then at intervals. Like for instance, uh, run this particular script every 15 minutes or that sort of thing. And the way you do this is through this program, launch control or launch control. Um, <laughs> there is a man entry for that, but essentially it has these two things. I think it might also have a list. But essentially you tell it to load a particular P list. And so basically it will read an XML like this, right? And go through it and like actually store it in memory and like run it however often you told it to run. You can also tell it to unload, which is basically don't remember that thing. I don't want you to do that anymore. Um, one thing I'll highly recommend if you're going to be getting into this sort of stuff at all, this is a Nagware application um, called Launch Control. Yes, I know. So launch control is essentially a GUI on top of launch control um, that points out all the user agents, all of these launch agents that you're running. Is anyone here from 60? All right, don't tell them there's a video of this. So for instance, this is a one that I'm working on for a project at work. And this just gives you a GUI. Underneath this, there's a plist file. Right, but Launch Control gives you this graphical user interface, so you can see like what program are we running? In this case, slash library slash script slash sixter. In this case, I'm not going to show it to you because it's proprietary, but it's a Ruby file. Um, and then we're also, we can also see that I'm telling you run it load, and also run the job every 900 seconds. In the XML format, it is seconds as far as the precision goes. So this allows us to run things on a schedule or right when your machine boots up. One last thing I'll plug, as far as stuff that's already baked onto your Mac, most of the stuff other than launch control, you already have. You don't need to install any of it. The other one you have, and you probably ignore this because I ignore it, <laughs> is this app called Automator. So Automator is a weird little robot guy holding a pipe. Looks kind of like that, right? And what this does is it gives, I'm going to call them normals. It's not a pejorative. Um, the, <laughs> the ability to create these Mac automation tools and things with a largely graphical interface where you can drag things over here from this list over to here and sort of chain them all together down to a list. We'll get back to this particular example a little bit later, but the nice thing about Automator is that you can make a whole bunch of stuff. You can make a workflow. You can make an actual bona fide application. In fact, you can even code sign it, and I think you might even be able to put it on the App Store. I haven't tried that. You make what's called a service, which we'll see one of those in a little bit. Print plugins, calendar alarms, image capture plugins, dictation commands, all sorts of really, really fun stuff like that, which I believe I mentioned on the next slide. So, <laughs> so those are the three core technologies. There are other things, like for instance, if you've been running Rails 5 for a while, you're probably already familiar with FS events D. Right, because Rails 5 spins up like 50 processes every time you have a server running. That is another new thing in Mac, so essentially watch a file on the system and then execute this thing every time it changes. So, let's talk about where Ruby fits in all of this. So, Ruby is installed on every Mac and has been for a very, very long time. In fact, it has been at 2.0.0 since Mavericks, which was released in 2013. In High Sierra, which is coming up in a couple of months probably, it's actually upgraded to 2.3.3. So much more first update since Mavericks, so that's fun. Um, and there's support baked right in the automator. You can kind of see that right here, where there's this run shell script action. And I'm telling it, I want to use user bin Ruby. And you'll notice that is user bin Ruby. And that means we're talking about system Ruby. Yes. <laughs> uh, when I was teaching at the Iron Yard, the first thing I did with students is like, okay, let's install RBM but not use System Ruby. In this particular case, when you start to talk about automating your Mac, your life is going to be so much easier if you just stick with System Ruby because you don't have to worry about, like, is RBM loaded? Are we going to find the right version of Ruby that I'm expecting this to be? And the key thing is, as I mentioned here, we're not developing, right? We're scripting. We're hacking. We're just having fun with stuff and trying to get it to do this one particular thing that's annoying the living crap out of you. 
And in this sort of environment, especially if you're going to be giving this app to other people, dependencies are the absolute devil. These people don't have Bundler installed. All right? <laughs> They don't have gems installed, they don't have any of that stuff. So you are stuck with stock, system, Ruby for what you want to do, which means using a lot of net HTTP and CGI and all sorts of fun, fun stuff. Luckily, JSON is part of the standard Ruby after 2.0. So a couple of examples to make this a little bit more clear. This is one I wrote, actually a couple of years ago at this point, called Pinboard Digest. How many people are familiar with Pinboard? Right? It's like a bookmarking service, kind of like Delicious back in the day. The delicious irony is that the maker of Pinboard bought Delicious, which I find fun. Um, what it essentially does is it pulls your last 10 links with a certain tags from Pinboard. It takes user input, so it figures out which tags it is you want. Processes said input into Ruby. The script calls the Pinboard API and then processes that JSON result. Copies marked down to your clipboard and then uses Apple Script to paste it into whatever document you have open at the time. So for instance, if I go here, and I go to Byword Services Pinboard Digest Demo, and what tags are safe on my <laughs> pinboard? We'll just type Ruby, and there we go. So this was essentially made by me a while back when I wanted to I was blogging a lot more often. Again, it was a long time ago. Um, and I wanted a quick way to do these sort of link list posts that are like the last 10 Ruby posts and I want to make a weekly post or something like that. And so I made this little service that was available in most text-based applications that would do all this for me. And you can see it pulls in the title and how many people are already familiar with Markdown? More hands. Markdown is wonderful. Um, <laughs> but it actually automatically puts them in a list, and then they're bolded, and they have links, and it also includes any notes I might have written into Pinboard when I saved it. And so the bits of this that tie it all together are here in Automator. There's this very first bit that's like, ask for text. So this is the little dialog box that popped up there that asks, what tags would you like, leave blank, or comma separate up to three? And then it passes that into this next step, which is a level shell script bit. And it passes it in as standard input. So in this Ruby script, and I'll show it to you in a minute, it takes that standard input and it does all the Ruby bits. Because one of the things you won't find over here is really like call a JSON API. Um, that's not one of the things that comes with out of the box. And then Ruby essentially passes that into this next action in Automator, which is copy to the clipboard. And then finally, we use a little bit of Apple Script to basically, when you run, tell the app that we were just in to activate if it wasn't already. And then tell system events keystroke v using command down. So that's command v, right? Command down v, right? So paste. There's probably a better way to do that. I never did find it in this work, just about. So that Ruby script, the Ruby bit of it, looks like this. It is, this is all of it, by the way. Um, so we're using net HTTPS to do the HTTP call that we're going to need. We use CGI to escape the input a little bit. And then finally, we use JSON to actually parse the results. I could probably use YAML if I wanted to, but JSON's been in there since 2.0, so I don't need to require it an extra dependency. So the way you would use this particular workflow is you would put your auth code, because that's how Pinboard works, in there. And then here's the standard input read, right? So this is the bit that takes whatever tags you input into that input box and assigns it as a variable input. And then we build up the URL for getting to Pinboard. And then if we had some input, we add this tag parameter to the URL. And then finally, by hand, <laughs> make our net HTTP call. And yeah, this is unsafe. I don't care. Um, send the request, JSON parse the request body, parse the text into the format we want, and then finally print it back out. So this is the bit that essentially we run through all this. 
print, so that's output, so that goes to here, copies into the clipboard, so now it's sitting in our clipboard, then it runs this, and it does that. So that is this particular script. I'm going to show you one other more complicated example that I did not write. Um, this one's called SearchLink. Um, it's by a, a fellow in Minnesota named Brett Terpstra, who might be more well known for markdown related applications. Um, for instance, marked. Um, if you use that, it's a really good like uh, markdown to PDF converter and sort of preview application for Mac. Um, he also makes a lot of free stuff, including some really good uh, doing, for instance. There's a nice little journal of what it is you're doing at this particular time that runs on the command line. Really fun when you have to talk to your boss about what you've been doing the last two weeks. <laughs> um, as well as some, a whole bunch of stuff. He's also the maintainer of an application called MVAlt, um, which is a note-taking application that's a lot of fun. Anyway, what SearchLink does is it replaces placeholder markdown with search results in the selected text. It is approximately 2,000 lines of Ruby, so I'm not going to put it all up on a slide. <laughs> Thank me later. Um, but to give you a quick demo of what that does, so if you're writing, see if I can do this. All right, that work. All right. So if you're writing some text, so this is my text, and I can't be bothered to Google for. Let's see. What would be good? Uh, Rubinius. That's how you spell that, right? All right. So what you do is you essentially do the markdown bit. And in here, you do just pound G, and then your search term. Right? And then when you're done, you select all the text, right click, go to services, and click search link. And it does that. The bang G essentially does a Google search and does the I'm feeling lucky and just pulls the first result, converts this instead of that pound G into this. If you have a bunch more on the page, it does footnotes and all sorts of other fun stuff. It's really fantastic, especially when you're writing. And I don't know if you're like me, but as you're writing stuff, you're like, I need a link here, I need a link here, I need a link here, I need a link here. And every time you stop to go find that link, you break out of the flow of your writing. So instead, you can do these little placeholders along the way. When you get done, run this. They all get filled in. And so Brett's application is actually very similar to mine, except it has even less steps. This service of his receives a selected text from any application, and it runs a shell script on it. That's all it does. Now, as I mentioned, this shell script is considerably longer, like a lot longer. Because he actually has a lot more features than I do. He also has a lot more people using the application because he's much more well known than I am. So, for instance, he asks you to check and see what version number you have and change some stuff depending. Because if you get further back to Mavericks, I believe the system Ruby at that point is 187, um, which is very old and crufty indeed. So these are two very quick examples of things you can do. Some other helpful tidbits if you start going down this rabbit hole. And it is a rabbit hole, trust me. Um, SQLite 3 is also available on every Mac. In fact, mostly, that's why Rails includes SQLite 3 as a default. It's already on every Mac. The other nice thing that I discovered in the last week is you can actually execute SQLite 3 queries from the command line. So rather than including an entire library, if you just need like one bit of data out of an application, you can just like SQLite 3, run this query on this file, and it will output the result. OA script here is a command line tool that's on every Mac to run Apple script from the command line. So it's a way to, from a Ruby script, run Apple script, which is super handy. Curl is also available on every Mac, at least since Mavericks. So if you don't feel like messing with net HTTP or you just need to ping something somewhere else, Curl works fantastic. And with all three of these, Ruby's system method, how many people are already familiar with system? Cool. Yeah, just run this string on the command line. It can be really handy when combined with these. So as we finish up the day, the things I want you to think about doing with this. 
because again, this is very much a like, did you know you can do this sort of talk? Like some other things you can think about are like text processing. We already saw one kind of example of that in the case of Brett Terpster's application. You can also do backup, like pull down all my Instagram photos and put them on Dropbox every 15 minutes or something like that. Um, file processing in general, I mean, literally whatever. You have Ruby, it's a full-fledged programming language combined with all these automation tools inside of your Mac that you can use in all sorts of weird, wild ways to solve the specific problem that you have in mind. All right, and with that note, thanks. <laughs>